My name is Riley and I am a 26-year-old guy from Milwaukee. This story I'm about to tell is true and took place about three years ago. Here's a bit of background information. It was late summer, probably early September, and a group of my friends and I decided we wanted to go on an urban exploration. This was something we had done often in some of the more rundown areas of Milwaukee, usually its northern side. It was pretty risky stuff because of the area's history of drugs, gang violence, and squatters. However, we were always very careful in these situations and had pretty good luck with never running into any crazy people. You could say we were just fascinated about what was inside the buildings and it gave us a bit of a rush. The night we left there was a small group of us going, five in total. It was me and my friends Jamie, Kevin, Vin, and Ty. We were all suburban white kids except Vin who was half Asian and Ty who was black. We were all relatively the same age, except Ty who was 29 and had gone to the same high school in the suburb of Bayside where we had lived. My friend Jamie was the only girl going and also happened to be the one who would drive us there because she had a large SUV that could fit us all. She also happened to be Kevin's girlfriend at the time. Anyway, we drive up to North Milwaukee, past some very bad neighborhoods and many rundown buildings. The location we were going to was an old elementary school that had shut down back in the late 90s. We had learned about it through an urban explorer Facebook group and managed to get in contact with a guy who had been there twice. He told me the building was quite large and had three floors as well as a basement floor that was completely destroyed due to flooding and exposure. He said that it still had a stage down there where the little kids would perform in plays and musicals. I also remember him telling me that he found some old costumes the kids used to perform in. But he also warned me that there was a lot of black mold and asbestos. Nonetheless, we parked in a large parking lot behind the school that at one point was a busy plaza, but was virtually empty now and was extremely cracked and had weeds growing all across it. We approached the back fence that separated the school playground and the lot. Most of the playground equipment was broken, rusted, or missing. We all walked together to a small opening in the fence by the swing set that would just allow you to get through if you were careful enough. Kevin stood at 6'5 and weighed about 230 pounds, so he knew he couldn't get through. It didn't matter, because we wanted one person to wait by the car so it wasn't broken into and keep an eye out for cops or any weirdos who came in after us. However, Jamie sort of chickened out due to the weather and wanted to wait with Kevin, so we let her. Ty, Vin, and I got through the fence relatively easily and made our way across the playground towards the back doors of the school. Along the way, I noticed a no trespassing sign a few feet away from the fence, but quickly pushed it out of my mind. There was once a chain on the double doors that kept people from entering the school, but someone had cut it long ago and kicked it off to the side where it lay coiled up and rusted. Now I'm going to talk about the weather that night, because I think it adds a lot to the story. It was in the high 80s, but it felt much higher due to the humidity. In the distance, I remember there were large storm clouds, so I knew we had to hurry with the exploration. Vin had brought a camera with him and Ty was recording with his cell phone and had a flashlight app open. We never ended up not needing the flashlight because enough light was trickling in through the broken ceiling and busted windows. As we entered, the door opened with almost no noise, but the floor was covered with pieces of broken ceiling, paint chips, trash, and dust. The air smelled very wet and musty. The temperature inside felt much hotter and more humid, but we just wiped our foreheads and held our water bottles in our hands. We looked around the floor, which was the ground floor, for about 15 minutes before we decided to move to the second floor. Ty suggested the basement, but the Facebook guy's description and the condition of the staircase changed all of our minds. Vin led the way, followed by me and Ty at the rear. The stairs were covered in debris, so our steps made very loud, crunching noises all the way up the staircase. Keep this in mind. We had gone on these explorations many, many times and had never ran into anyone, except a very nice homeless woman and her dog many years ago who told us to stay away from heroin. You could say we were overconfident and had our guard down. We reached the second floor, which had many more classrooms than the bottom floor. Most of the rooms were completely trashed, either due to the weather or vandals who had come in. The desks laid all over the floor, either broken or knocked over. Most of the windows were boarded up or broken, and graffiti covered almost every inch of the building that we had seen. However, some rooms were spared and looked as if the students who once sat in them had just vanished into thin air, while nature slowly took the building. Many of the desks still had supplies in them, the coat hooks still had coats on them, and the chalkboard still had writing on it. Ty even found a desk plate with a teacher's name on it, 
It read, Miss Johnson, after we wiped away the dust. I eventually found a folder in one of the desks that belonged to a kid named Kiana. I gathered that she was a girl who was in fourth grade and even saw a date on one of her old assignments that indicated it was from February of 1999. Many of the rooms that were in better shape had things like this, so we eventually got bored and decided it was time to move on. As we approached the staircase to the third floor, I had a strange feeling in the pit of my stomach. The kind of feeling you get when you think someone is about to jump out and scare you any minute. I told Ty and Vin about it and Ty told me not to be a wimp and just keep moving because he was starting to hear thunder in the distance. I noticed that it was starting to get cooler in the building and it was much easier to breathe as we walked up to the third floor. It was here where we would run into a strange and frightening situation. I noticed that the third floor of the school was different from the other floors. The floor had much more trash on it, trash that appeared to be fairly recent. A lot of old furniture was put in the back part of the first hallway we had turned into and piled very high. Then Ty said something that for whatever reason gave me a cold chill up my spine. He noticed that the floor was not nearly as dusty and had fresher footprints than any we had seen earlier. We walked for a few more minutes, and I could tell that we were very nervous about running into someone. Just before we reached a hallway with a lot of classrooms, I decided to text Kevin to see if there was any strange activity outside. He replied within 10 seconds and said that it looked normal, but that it was going to rain any second. I told him to stay focused and message me if anything odd happened. We looked through many of the old rooms and found nothing but trash, old furniture, and rubble. One of the rooms Vin had walked into had half of its floor caved in. He was lucky that he saw it when he did. A few more minutes went by and I heard Ty say, Dude, check this out. Me and Vin walked over to him and saw he was holding a bag full of old used syringes. The needles looked very old and the plastic Ziploc bag holding them was torn and tattered. I told him to drop the bag before he got hepatitis or AIDS. We all sort of chuckled and continued to walk down the hall toward the furniture pile. We noticed that behind this pile was a staircase that was completely filled with old shelves, chairs, and tables. To our right was a large room that was relatively clear, but had mattresses scattered about. There were a lot of cigarette butts laying on the floor and an old rusted oil drum was in the middle of the room. Vin said that the room used to be a library because of a small plaque he had seen above the doorway. It made sense to me why there were so many shelves and chairs piled up right outside. As we got closer to the far end of the room, we examined the mattresses. There were about five of them, and they were all very dirty and torn up. Some had disgusting-looking stains and had horrible body odor smells to them. Vin noticed a small stack of pornographic magazines by a bed on the farthest side of the room. We all got a giggle out of it. The room had two large windows parallel to each other, but they were boarded up and allowed almost no light into the room. As we got to the back of the room, we heard the sound of music being played. All of us froze in unison as the door swung open. There was a man at the entrance of the door. The look on his face told us that he was not happy we were there. He was average height, had a shaved head and a short scruffy beard. He wore a faded brown shirt and some old white basketball shorts. His shoes were white some point, but now they had a stained brown look to them. He was a white man, but his whole body was covered in a thick layer of dirt. I'll never forget his eyes. They were a very pale blue and looked like the eyes of a wolf. However, at the same time, I noticed the man behind him who gave me chills. This man never once stood up and sat on a lawn chair with his left shoulder pointing towards us. He turned his head to look at us. The man had bright pink hair tied in a ponytail and appeared to have no teeth at all. He looked very skinny and his skin looked tight and pale. His eyeballs bulged slightly and gave him an even more frightening appearance. He wore a white t-shirt and black shorts. This man never once said a word to us. The man at the door spoke in a very rough and direct voice. He asked us what we were doing in the building and if we were cops. Ty answered first and told him that we were just documenting the old historical buildings in the area and that we had no intention of bothering anyone. The man appeared to relax more and asked us how long we were wanting to stay. I jumped in and told him that we were just about done and that we had to head out before the weather got bad. The man lit a cigarette and asked us if we wanted one, but we all declined. He then offered to give us a tour of the building, but we all quickly and in unison said no to the offer. The man's demeanor changed again as a dark and angry look fell on his face, almost as if we offended him by refusing the tour. He eventually chuckled and said okay. 
He introduced himself as Walter and said the pink-haired man was Ronnie. To our surprise, the man cupped his hands as he hollered out quite loudly for someone named Marty. There was no reply and the bald man said he must have gone to go number two somewhere. As we talked a few more minutes, I took out my cell phone and saw that Kevin had messaged me several times. The messages said that a man had walked into the building about a minute ago and that we needed to get the hell out of there as soon as possible. The man asked us how many of us there were all together. I lied and told him seven, because at this point I was ready to shit my pants and the feeling in my stomach was coming back. There was something off about these guys. Something told me that they were dangerous. Vin and Ty obviously felt the same way and had very worried looks on their faces. All the while the radio continued to play, but Walter ordered Marty to turn the damn radio off and that it was giving him a migraine. As he did it, two things entered my head. He said the pink-haired guy was Ronnie, not Marty, and that as Ronnie Marty or whoever the heck reached for the radio, I noticed a bungee cord wrapped around his arm and a syringe in it. I don't think Walter noticed any of the things I was picking up on, but before anything could happen, another man entered the room. This guy was by far the weirdest and most unsettling of the group. He was fairly short and had medium-length Bieber-style dark hair. His clothes looked much newer, but far too big for him. He had a blue Milwaukee Brewers t-shirt tucked into his oversized red sweatpants. His face looked sharp and leathery, but he appeared to have some sort of skin condition. His eyes were a beady black color and wide open. Parts of his face were a very bright pink, and he had a large amount of bumps on the lower corner of his bottom lip. He spoke in a more high-pitched rural accent. The other two men remained where they had been, Walter in the doorway and Marty Ronnie in his chair. The new man said his name was George and that he was very interested in Vin's camera. He asked what kind it was, where Vin got it, how much it cost and why he had it. Vin explained that his hobby was filming videos and that he would often photograph at weddings and other events. This was all true and the man immediately perked up and smiled. The kind of smile that gives you an uneasy feeling in your gut. The best way to describe it would be how the Grinch smiled in the old animated movie. As creepy as that was, this is when this gets really creepy. He asks Vin if he has ever recorded any little girl's beauty pageants or stuff along that line. Vin told him no, and the man genuinely looked disappointed. He went on to say some more creepy shit about how hot the girls in these pageants were and that he would die to be able to be alone with one of them. Our faces told the story of how we felt hearing this hit, but the man seemed oblivious. He asked us all if we had any kids of our own. Ty slipped up and told him that he had two twin girls who were two years old. The man giggled in a very creepy and cringy way. He then asked Ty if he ever left the girls alone by themselves or if he had a babysitter. Ty told him that he and his fiancée watched the kids the majority of the time, but would occasionally have his aunt babysit them if they could not. George asked Ty if he had any photos of the girls. Ty showed him a few on his phone and the man asked a very strange question. He asked if he would allow his daughter to date a guy like him. By this point, I'm sure Ty wanted to drop this creep, but he also knew that the other two were behind us and could possibly have knives or guns. So instead he said he would have to get to know him more. The man giggled again and said that he could get to know them when he babysat them. The tone of his voice still gives me chills. It was said in such a slow, seductive type of way that left little doubt as to what this guy was. I saw Ty's brow drop and knew he was getting pretty upset. I took my phone out and texted Kevin to honk his horn a bunch of times. As I did this, the creepy weirdo stepped toward me and asks me who I was messaging. He was close enough for me to smell his bourbon breath. I leaned back slightly and told him that we needed to leave soon before the weather got really bad. Walter spoke again and said that we might as well stay since the storm would begin any moment and he didn't want us to get wet. Vin explained that we had two friends waiting in a car for us outside, just as he said that we could hear a car horn blaring outside. Both the creep and bald man showed no reaction to what happened and insisted we stay and invite our friends in. We all stood there and explained that we had to leave and eventually they agreed. Nonetheless, George insisted that he walk us out, and so we walked and got to the ground floor. As we crossed the floor, we could hear this creepy man muttering to himself and giggle every now and then. We stepped outside and the weather was much cooler. The air smelled of ozone and there was a static feeling in the air as small droplets of rain hit my face. George walked us over to the area of the fence we had entered. Ty slipped out first, followed quickly by Vin. They both stumbled down the steep hill and were waiting for me to go. As I tried to go through the fence, George pushed it against my chest. I was on edge, but it still caught me off guard. 
I gasped and he leaned in real close. The smell of bourbon made me turn my head slightly. I'll never forget what he said to me in a very quick burst. I know you know what I am. It doesn't matter because I like it. You're lucky that fine girl was in that car with that fat expletive, or I would have done whatever I wanted to her. As he said whatever, he said it much slower, seductively and emphasized like he had earlier, and licked his lips slowly at the end of the sentence. His beady eyes widened and he let go of the fence. I quickly slipped through and tumbled down to the concrete. I was totally fine, but I looked up to the creepy psycho. Ty, Vin, Kevin and Jamie were all there to help me up. They all looked up at the man in shock and Ty hurled an insult at him. George slowly rose up and looked at Ty through the fence. He put his tongue on the chain link fence and made a licking motion. He winked, giggled, flashed his Grinch smile and said his last words to us. For your girls and gave a very direct point to Ty. It took everything we had to keep Ty from going after him, but eventually we lost sight of George and we got Ty to calm down. We sat in the car as our adrenaline rushes dumped and left us feeling exhausted. We told Kevin and Jamie everything we had seen, heard, and felt. It was in the car that we decided to make this our last urban exploration ever. We all agreed unanimously that this was too close of a call. As I sat in the car, I kept thinking about each of the men we had seen, who exactly were they? They were obviously addicts of some kind, but something seemed off about each of them. The pink-haired man said nothing and was like a ghost. The bald man said little, but his wolf-like eyes spoke so much and the creepy man couldn't stop talking. I would later try to find these men on a website that posted jail mugshots. I could never find them until a few weeks ago Vin sent me a link to a sex offender registry website. My heart nearly stopped. Pictured was the guy who said his name was George. He looked much younger and his hair was shorter, but it was undeniably him. He even had the same creepy smile in the photo. However, his real name was Charles Earl Daly. He was a wanted sex offender from Arkansas who was considered to be a very high-risk offender and possibly armed. His crimes included rape of minor younger than 12 years old, child molestation, enticing a child for sex via the internet, stalking, indecent exposure and sodomy. Reading this made me want to vomit and made me angry that it had taken us so long to find something on this guy, but I was amazed that Vin had found something. I eventually told the police about how we ran into this guy, but nothing came of it because the old school was officially torn down several months ago and I had no idea. Life has gone on normally. Our groups of friends still talk, hang out, and reminisce about our exploration days. Nonetheless, the number one thing we always talk about is whatever happened to those men. Where is Charles Earl Daly? who wasn't fortunate enough to escape from these guys. It still sends a shiver up my spine to think about the danger we were in. A cold, cold shiver. Back when I was much younger, my friends and I were into urban exploring before it was even really a thing. We grew up in a pretty rough area, with a lot of old apartment buildings that had to be abandoned and eventually demolished due to asbestos. That stuff made them basically fireproof, but where fire and smoke will kill you quick, asbestos will kill you slow. But try explaining that to a bunch of teenagers, actively looking for somewhere to hide from grown-ups, so they could do some distinctly grown-up things. Where other people saw a decrepit, dusty crap hole, we saw our own little corner of paradise. A home away from home, or maybe home is too strong a word, but you get the idea. Anyway, there was one particular estate that was almost completely bereft of inhabitants, having been gradually relocated by the city council until there must have been no more than two or three families left over. It was like an actual ghost town. Even the local corner shop had its shutters permanently down with a for sale sign quickly following its indefinite closure. But like I said, that kind of place was our bread and butter. So when they moved out, we moved in. There was this one set of high-rise flats, that's apartments to you North Americans reading, that we used to visit on the regular. The heating and other utilities had been switched off for a while, and this was in the middle of winter. So we used to stash cans of cider in the old cupboards and they'd basically act like walk-in fridges. It got to the point that we ended up occupying one of the flats, bringing over an old nylon string guitar and other amenities so the place felt a bit more homely. So this one night, just after Christmas, about five of us pile into the old place to get drunk and have a sing-song. I remember that we were halfway through Bowie's Man Who Sold the World, when the off-key twang of a string breaking had us all groaning with disappointment. What's more, it was the G-string. Take a moment to get all the broken G-string jokes out of your system, 
Okay, you done? Good. On with the story. Anyone who knows anything about playing guitar will tell you that break a top or bottom string, and it's not the end of the world, but break your G string, and nothing quite sounds the same. So there we were, basically condemned to a silent disco for the night. But it didn't damp our spirits entirely, so we committed to staying for a few hours to at least make the most of the evening. We're all just sitting around, chatting bollocks and bumming smokes off each other, when one of us loudly hushes the rest before holding a single finger in the air, as if to say, listen. There's a brief silence, and I do mean a silence. No one heard a thing. So the lad who'd shushed everyone just put it down to him hearing things. The mood softens again quickly, and we're back to drinking and taking the piss out of each other. Only a little while later, the same lad does the same hushing thing. He's not alone this time, though. Another one of us swore down that he too had heard something, a scratching or shuffling noise coming from the dark corridor outside the flat. Have one lad with an attack of paranoia and you take this piss out of him. Have two lads hear the same bloody thing, and you start to take things a bit more serious. One of us pokes their head out of the flat, shining the light of his phone screen into the darkness, before turning back to tell us there was nothing there. These flats were half falling down. It was perfectly reasonable to expect them to creak and croak a fair bit. A few of us managed to relax again, but the two guys who'd heard the noises remained anxious, shooting each other nervous looks in between scanning the flat's open doorway for movement. Cut to a few hours later, and it's coming up to midnight. Energy levels are dipping severely, and so are the noise levels. This meant the atmospherics were perfectly attuned for us to perfectly hear the creaking of a floorboard, just above our heads. This wasn't just the rundown condition of the building either. It was painfully obvious that the slow and deliberate creak came from a footfall on the floor above us. Don't ask me how we knew that. Sometimes your gut just tells you everything you need to know about a certain sound or shape in the darkness. That's how the human race has survived for so long and so successfully. There really is such a thing as a sixth sense. As soon as we hear that creak, we all freeze. I mean proper statue still, barely even breathing with all eyes glued to the ceiling. We start asking each other what the hell that was, but we all knew someone or something was up there and had been up there the entire time. I should add at this point, we'd managed to compile a little collection of wooden sticks, iron bars, and other such debris that we told ourselves was our weapon stash. It was all just a bit of a joke, to be honest. They were of purely totemic value, but in the moments that followed that horrible bloody creek, I thanked that was holy that we'd had the foresight to collect them. Each of us grabbed something to defend ourselves with before falling silent again, listening out for any other creaking sounds above us. We weren't left waiting long. Another creak, then another, each one getting closer and closer to where the front entrance to the upstairs flat would be. We couldn't help but sit there terrified, listening as whatever was up there got closer and closer to us. When the footsteps stopped, one of us plucked up the courage to creep towards the open front door of the flat and stick their head out. The next thing I know, we're just pouring down the stairs of the apartment block, with the lad who scouted the stairs out shouting how there's someone up there. We were scared, maybe a little over paranoid, but over the next few days we started to question if we'd even seen what we thought we had. I remember seeing the shape of something on the stairs above us, but I wasn't 100% sure it was a man, and neither was anyone else if we were honest with ourselves. In the end, I had convinced myself we'd imagined the whole thing, and decided to run a little experiment. I left a loaf of bread in the lobby of the apartment block, intending to prove that there was no one living there when the loaf was still there, growing mold a few days later. But when I went back, it was gone. Years later, we watched the council demolish those flats as wrecking balls smashed into the brickwork and plastic window frames. We mourned our old hideaway, yes, but mostly we wondered if whoever was in there would be buried in the rubble. A few winters ago, I worked security for a company that was in the process of converting an abandoned warehouse into one that was up to par for modern day work. This was a pretty tedious task. The warehouse had been abandoned since the 80s and the decades had not been kind. The plants had not overtaken the building as it was well within a concrete jungle, but it was still far enough off the beaten path that it had attracted a number of residents who had not been kind to it. Most of the copper that wasn't bolted down or just too difficult to reach had been stolen, so all of the wiring had to be redone. 
The windows had cracked. The ceiling had leaked in places. You get the idea. In truth, part of me wondered if it wouldn't have been easier just to tear the place down and rebuild. The earlier days of the job were largely uneventful. The squatters and random urban explorers quickly caught on to the fact the building was being renovated. A chain-link fence topped with barbed wire was up around most of the construction equipment. New locks were placed on the doors, and there were various security installments to deter anyone from trying to make off with exposed equipment or materials. You know those motion-sensing lights that people place outside their homes to deter burglars? We had a sort of enhanced version of those. They would flood an area with this bright, almost sickly green light, but it was blinding to whoever was caught in it. We also had a silent alarm that would sound if it were triggered, and as a final failsafe, a deafening alarm could be pulled by security in conjunction with it. For some relevant context, there was one largely unsupervised entrance into the building. A series of maintenance access corridors spanned throughout the walls, and these could mostly only be entered from inside, but there was one external entrance. There was a sort of unloading area that adjoined to the basement of the building. Trucks could drive down a ramp into a tunnel and enter this area, and along the side of the tunnel, there was one entrance into the maintenance access corridors. Most of the employees weren't aware this door existed as it now served precious little purpose. Hell, I only knew of it because it was pointed out to me by some of the renovators. That tunnel and the adjoining area would likely be the last place to be touched. And in all honesty, I wasn't even sure it was going to be as I didn't know if the current company intended to make use of it. The door wasn't in plain sight. It was behind a guardrail and it went up into the building at a sort of angle that made it difficult to see unless you were facing it from a certain direction. It would be entirely possible to walk or drive right past it and never know it existed. It was an imposing, albeit unassuming, old steel door. The hinges themselves had some rust on them, but the door was in mostly good shape. It was dark in color, though it didn't seem to be painted. The handle was stainless steel and had aged the best of all from the door. This was the one giveaway of the door's existence. If you were in the tunnel and it was dark enough, a flashlight or natural lighting would glint off of the handle, indicating it was there. This door was kept locked for obvious reasons, but it was easy to forget that it was there. We never patrolled the maintenance access corridors as part of the security routine. It was generally assumed that to even get inside of them, an intruder would have to trip the alarm well before even being able to enter those, and it wasn't entirely safe. There were exposed wires and those corridors were extremely claustrophobic, not to mention that once you were in them, you had to know where the exits were or you'd be wandering around lost for quite a while. Moreover, some of the exits no longer worked, or at least weren't operational for now due to the ongoing construction. This brings us to December 22nd. It was one of the worst sorts of winter nights. It was cold and it was raining, but it was just warm enough that we'd be pelted with freezing rain and denied snow. The wind didn't quite howl, but it had an eerie moan as it passed by the warehouse. At this time of year, it got dark around six or so, so by midnight, it was nearly pitch black outside. The storm just added to this. It had been a particularly boring night. The lull of the rain and the constant hum of yellow fluorescent lights had me rather sleepy. I had tried reading to pass the time, there wasn't any Wi-Fi and phone reception was rather poor, but I couldn't make myself focus. I considered sleeping, but I had this weird gut feeling that I needed to stay awake. I wasn't afraid and I didn't feel like I was being watched or anything like that. It's hard to explain. I just had this sense that I could nap later, but I needed to wait up a bit just to be sure it'd be appropriate. I didn't want my boss reviewing the footage and thinking I had gone to sleep too early, I suppose, but I don't feel like that was quite what I was thinking at the time. So it was with lidded eyes and a nodding head that I heard a click from somewhere within the facility. At first, my mind didn't even register it. I had just let it be the background noise, and then I realized it wasn't that. It was an abnormal sound. At once, I was wide awake and immediately looked at my surroundings. Nothing had fallen and nothing was out of place. I was almost tempted to shrug off as an electrical issue, but it just didn't sit right with me. I had been there long enough that I knew more or less what the building sounded like, and that wasn't a noise I'd heard before. I decided I'd just do a routine patrol, nothing fancy, and make sure the doors were still locked, and that would be enough. As I left the rudimentary security post, which was really a desk surrounded by filing cabinets, I began to feel a sense of unease creeping into my spine. I couldn't place what it was, 
but the further I got from my vantage point which allowed me to see most of the main floor, the less safe I felt. I felt exposed, vulnerable. Every step I took made me want to retreat back to the desk. I shook it off. I told myself that I was being silly. Hell, I'd chased off homeless people before. It wouldn't be any different if that's what it was. The self-reassurance didn't work. This felt different somehow. I went door to door and each of them was locked as it was supposed to be. Seeing this made me feel a little bit better. And by the time I'd visited the final door, I was mostly able to shove the burgeoning dread out of my mind. I was satisfied with the inspection and figured the sound must have been from the storm somehow. It didn't make sense, but it was the only thing I could figure at the time. I shrugged it off and began to walk back to the desk. I'd almost made it to my seat when I heard a sound that sent a chill down my spine. It was a distinct rattling sound as though someone was rattling a doorknob somewhere within the facility. I froze and I listened. The sound continued only for an instant and then there was a gentle but distinct thud. Someone had tried to push their weight against a door and it had held. My first instinct was to check my pager and see if the silent alarm had been tripped. To my surprise and confusion, it hadn't. I frowned. I would write it off as a wayward bat thrashing about in the rafters, but the sound had seemingly come from against an outside wall, and a bat wouldn't be able to rattle a doorknob. I remained still for a moment. I listened for something, anything, but all I could hear was the rain against the rooftop, the wind, and the din of cheap warehouse lighting. I sighed through my nose. The fear had given way to a feeling of annoyance now. I started the long walk across the concrete floor to check the doors once again, and then I remembered it. The outside door, the click. Someone was in the maintenance corridors. My heart rate immediately picked up. That feeling of unease had given way to near terror. My first instinct was to trip the loud alarm, but for some reason I couldn't bring myself to do it. If the person didn't know that I was in the building, it'd tip them off. It was possible they were lost and trapped in the corridors for now, but if they got out, I set off the silent alarm instead. I knew I was going to have to go into the corridors, but this was extremely unsettling. I was going to have to hope I came in behind the person and that I was the one stalking them, not the other way around. I quietly walked over to the nearest door, a tiny metal frame with a glass window that allowed one to see inside and peered into the corridor. It was virtually pitch black. I looked to the left and the right. The right led to a sort of junction before hitting a corner of the building, and the left was a long, empty corridor. I slowly opened the door, letting it gently shut behind me, and flicked on my flashlight. This corridor was empty. I went to the right first. I figured that if the intruder came down the left corridor, I would have ample time to react but I didn't want to be caught by surprise by him rounding the corner. As I reached the turn, however, I hesitated. I was utterly terrified that I would round the corner and be face to face with the intruder. I could almost feel their eyes on me. I even took a step backward. I listened. No footsteps, no breathing, nothing. I bit my bottom lip and rounded the turn and was greeted by an equally empty corridor. This one didn't run as far. I was relieved. I began making slow, deliberate steps down the corridor careful not to trip over wiring and pipes, and would stop every so often to listen. It was still silent, eerily so. I had made it about halfway down the corridor when I heard a doorknob rattled again. It was hard to ascertain how close I was to it now. As the sound echoed down the hallways, I froze. The rattling continued before it was followed by a heavy bang. They weren't being subtle anymore. They had slammed into the door. I wasn't sure if they were even in the corridor anymore and decided now was the best time to turn back. The police had to be here soon. I would just go back to my desk and wait it out. That's what I should have done from the beginning. Entering the maze was a mistake. I rounded the corner to get back to the door from where I'd entered, and as my flashlight fell on the corridor, I almost missed it. Almost. The light illuminated a silhouette at the end of the hall. There was a man, or what I assumed to be a man, standing still at the end of my flashlight's beam. He was tall, extremely so. He was every bit of 6'6", and he wasn't the lanky type. If anything, he seemed somewhat overweight and was a bit hunched over in the narrow confines of the corridor. He seemed to have his head angled down a bit, and he was wearing all black. We both stood there for a moment, motionless. I was paralyzed with fear. I can't say what it was about him, but he just felt wrong. 
This didn't seem like a squatter seeking shelter, I can't explain it, but I knew that he had malicious intent. Trying to hide the shakiness in my voice, I summoned the scariest tone I could muster and shouted out, Security! Freeze! He didn't move for a moment. I began walking towards him, fully intending to exit through the door in which I'd entered and locking him in the chamber, and he started barreling towards me. I mean a full-on sprint. He was faster than I expected, faster than he should have been, and the footsteps echoed in the corridor. I instinctively bolted for the door, but I shouldn't have. It made him rapidly draw closer to me. As I ran for the door, I could hear his staggered breathing as he drew nearer and nearer. He beat me to the door. He knew that's where I was headed, and he stopped and waited for me. I froze once again. I wasn't able to hide that my hands were shaking. The flashlight beam thrashed wildly about the corridor. He seemed even larger up close. He stared down at me with inky black eyes. The man was probably in his mid-40s, but it was hard to tell. He had long gray hair and similarly gray stubble, and his face was eaten up with what looked like pockmarks. He had water dripping off of his black clothes, and the top of his head was covered with a black beanie. He smiled a wide, toothy grin at me and took a step towards me. I wanted to run, but he knew that the nearest doors were locked. It was pointless. Don't come any closer, I demanded. He took another step, and then another, and he was now uncomfortably close to me. He had that rancid, sticky sweet smell that rotting meat has, topped with cigarette smoke. He leaned down a bit to be directly in my face, and I caught a hint of peppermint and alcohol on his breath. He reached a gloved hand towards me and placed it on my shoulder. He spoke with this childlike voice. It was falsely high-pitched and sounded like a voice that a kindergarten-aged child would use to taunt one of their friends. But this came over his natural gritty baritone and years of being a hard smoker. Tag, you're it. He kept his hand on my shoulder and just stared at me, grinning for what felt like an hour. And then he slowly turned around and bolted back down the corridor, laughing with his horrible laugh as he sprinted into the dark. I didn't move. I couldn't move. I waited until I heard the footsteps and demonic laugh grow quieter and quieter, and when I was sure he was far enough away, I ran for the door, nearly fell out of it, forced it shut and locked it behind me. I then sprinted across the concrete floor to the main entrance, sounded the noise alarm and ran outside into the rain. I stood outside, back against the wall of the building, panting for breath. I couldn't even feel the cold. I didn't feel the cold until I heard the sirens. I was numb when the police walked past me. I was able to talk, but it felt like my body was on autopilot and I was watching from outside of it. They combed the entire building corridors included, but they didn't find anyone. They did, however, find that the door to the maintenance access from the tunnel was open. They also found a large butcher knife, a half-drank bottle of bottom-shelf vodka, and a sheet of notebook paper with a smiley face drawn on it between the door and the guardrail. 